Good evening. I am Mark Duber, Chair of the American University Board of Trustees. I'd like to welcome back President Burwell and invite tonight's guest of honor, Secretary Lonnie Bunch, to join us. On behalf of the entire board, I also want to add our thanks to all of you for your support, your leadership, and your partnership in moving AU forward. Award annually since 1990, the Cyrus A. Ansari Medal is a cherished tradition of this Board of Trustees. It was established to recognize significant accomplishments, a spirit of leadership, and a dedication to AU. The medal bears the name of our esteemed Board of Trustees Chairman Emeritus, Cyrus Ansari, an alumnus of great distinction and a generous philanthropic leader. Cy, we are delighted to have you and your wife, Jan, here tonight. Thank you for your leadership and all you have done for AU. We are also thrilled to welcome the Ansari's children and their families. Doug and Nancy Ansari, Jeff and Karen Ansari, Perry and Kevin Davis, and Brad Ansari. Among them, we have three additional AU alumni. Doug and Karen earned MBAs in 1997 and in 1999, respectively, and Perry earned a BA in 1986. Last, but certainly not least, the Ansari's grandchildren, Kelsey and Ashley, are also with us tonight. They have read Secretary Bunch's book, A, Fool, er, a Fool's Errand, and have heard him speak at their school and did not want to miss tonight's special occasion with their family. Welcome. Recipients of the Answering Medal share a sense of momentum in their professional careers and in their commitments to AU. Like all of you, they are champions for our university and, and it is this exemplary leadership that sets them apart in our community and in the world. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's honoree, American University College of Arts and Science double alumnus, Lonnie Bunch. As the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie oversees 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, as well as numerous research centers and several education units. In addition, Secretary Bunch is the first African-American and the first historian to hold this position. Secretary Bunch has a long and celebrated career as an educator and historian, including serving as founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture. He is a widely published and recognized author and a powerful advocate for justice and equality. Among his many honors, Secretary Bunch has received appointments to the Committee for the Preservation of the White House and a Freedom, of Freedom Medal from the Roosevelt Institute. Two examples that highlight the breadth and integrity of his work. Throughout his career, Secretary Bunch has developed unmatched expertise and an unwavering commitment to presenting the truth. We are privileged to have Secretary Bunch as a member of the American University community. In recognition of his life's work and an enduring commitment to his alma mater, we are proud to name him the 2020 Cyrus A. Ansari Medal recipient. Please join me in congratulating Secretary Lonnie Bunch. Lonnie, congratulations on this honor. And we are so grateful to have you join us this evening. And to everyone- I am so humbled. I am so humbled. Um, I'm touched. Um, I know that everything I've accomplished in part is because of AU. And so it's really important for me to make sure that I give back to AU, but this recognition means a great deal to me and especially under your leadership as president. 
Well, Lonnie, thank you. And, and to everyone watching tonight, I've had the honor of, of being able to work with Lonnie and uh, spend time since I've been here at American University and have found his wisdom and guidance uh, incredibly helpful to us and our community. And I'm not the only one uh, in terms of uh, thoughts and Lonnie. And we actually have heard from several of your predecessors in terms of Ansari Award winners. And they asked me if I would be willing to share their thoughts tonight too. And so before we turn to our q and A, I I wanted to do that. We heard from Susan Rice, the 2018 Ansari Medal winner. And Susan writes, Sylvia, I was delighted to hear the news that Lonnie is this year's Ansari recipient. Please send him my congratulations on this well-deserved recognition and my thanks for all he has done to preserve our shared histories. From Susan Zarinsky, who was the 2019 Ansari Medal winner, she writes, Sylvia, standout choice in recognizing Lonnie. Humbled, frankly, to share this honor with him, my fellow classmate. Lonnie Bunch's drive and sheer force of will got the National Museum of African American History and Culture built. Lonnie has been an agent of change as this country tries to unravel systemic racism and achieve sustained change in the social injustice that permeates this country. We can take pride in the accomplishments of Lonnie Bunch. Clearly, the class of 1974 was a powerhouse. <laughs> oh my goodness. Clearly there was something in the water that year. <laughs> um, I'm overwhelmed, my goodness. Two people I admire so much. Uh, I'm gonna cry. That, that makes me feel very, very good. Well, clearly they think highly, uh, that highly of you. And so um, Lonnie, again, thank you for joining us this evening. And we're gonna do a bit of a Q&A with the two of us. And then we're going to turn to some questions um, from the folks that have joined us. And I'm actually going to start with the title of your book, which is A Fool's Errand. And could you tell us a little bit about how that title reflects the story um, of the museum and what you built? Um, Susan referred to it um, in her comments to you. And could you tell us a little bit about um, how what the challenges were. I'm not sure everyone sort of remembers and reflects on that. And so what were you facing and how did you work through uh, and get to the place where we are, where we have this wonderful museum that, um, that you know, we learned 8,000 people normally attend every day uh, that impacts our history and our learning in our nation. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey that what you referred to as a fool's errand? Well, of course I can. And that title came from a book that I read at AU as a sophomore um, in college. So it was a book that talked about um, how important it is to try to do something that'll make your country better. And even if you fail, even if it's a fool's errand, you've made the effort to change a nation. So for me, um, building this museum was, as somebody whispered in my ear when I first took the job, why don't you want to be don't you want to be the second director not the first because the first director is going to fail and you don't want to look like a fool so that's where i got the title from but they were right when we began this endeavor i began with a staff of one no idea where the museum would be no collections no money raised but what we had was a commitment to saying how can this be more than a museum how can it be a place that uses history, that uses collections as a way to help America remember? Remember its tortured racial past, remember people that they know like Martin Luther King and Sojourner Truth in new ways, but more importantly, expand the narrative, introduce people to individuals that they don't know, like my own grandmother who took in other people's wash and scrubbed people's floors so that her kids and grandchildren wouldn't have to work on bended knee. So it was really important to remember and to craft a place that said, this is the story of us all. This is not a story of one community only. This is a story that in some ways is the quintessential American story that has profoundly shaped who we are in this nation. So ultimately, the, what really got us through this was, yes, we had to figure out how to get support from Congress. Yes, we had to figure out how to raise more money than the Smithsonian had ever raised before. 
Um, yes, we had to figure out how do you build on the National Mall? How do you get a right to build on the mall? And then how do you build on the mall? But more importantly than anything else, what kept us going was the notion that for a hundred years, people had been trying to build a museum on the National Mall. And for a variety of reasons, it never happened. So every day I would wake up and I would think about somebody from 1917 or 1930 or 1980 um, and realize that my job was to fill the dreams of many generations. And the thing that made it work was our dear mutual friend, John Lewis that John Lewis fought for this idea. John Lewis worked with me. John Lewis made sure we got the support we needed. So in some ways, all the work we did, we were blessed to have the angel of John Lewis. And that museum will always be a monument to people who wanted, who struggled, who demanded that America live up to its stated ideals, one like John Lewis. That's terrific. And, and as we think about and remember, um, that incredible warrior that we lost um, uh, this this past year. Lonnie, a little more about some of the things, because it is kind of interesting how some of the pieces came together, like the question of getting the the land on the mall, that that is not a small item. And, and maybe you want to spend a minute or two on how did you get that to happen? Because that one was, uh, was and even when you got it, the issues, there were issues I understand in terms of water flowing under it. And I mean, if not just getting the land, but everything, but the land is I think one that folks will find interesting. Well, normally when Congress asks the Smithsonian to build a museum, they say, put a museum here. They tell you where, but there was a real debate about whether it should be on the mall. They said, there are four sites you've got to evaluate. Two, I still can't find, they're way off the mall. Um, one was an older building and one was the spot that we were in. So part of the notion was that I felt that the mall was where the world comes to understand what it means to be an American. And it was crucially important then for this museum to be on the mall to help enrich um, and make a more inclusive understanding of who we are as a people, as a nation. But there was a lot of debate. So what I realized is that I would take people around, take the Board of Regents and take people who are instrumental and show them the sites and let them realize what a difference it is to be on the mall or not on the mall. And then it helped that I was able to have a conversation with Oprah Winfrey, who reminded me that people will give more money if it's on the mall than off the mall. So I used that. I said, you know, if we don't get on the mall, I'll have to keep coming back to Congress for more money. They said, welcome to your spot on the mall. Um, but you're right, building was also a challenge because under the mall is water. And the smart engineers told me that, oh, um, basically it's the creek, the old Tiber Creek. So you build your foundation like the bow of a ship. Well, it turned out it wasn't the creek. It was an, it was an aquifer of water. And the pressure from the bubble of the water is what kept the Washington Monument up. So the concern was that if I pierced the bubble, the Washington Monument would lean. Um, and there were many things I wanted after my name, but not that he knocked down the Washington Monument. Um, so really, I had to learn a lot of things like, how do you get rid of water? Um, and so this was an experience that challenged everything I knew um, and allowed me to draw from many of the people that I've known over my career to be able to actually build a museum that would matter for the American public. Another part of the museum that I think is particularly interesting, you mentioned it, the, there wasn't a collection. So the issue of a collection, and, and it's not as if there were places to go and get parts of the collection, purchase a collection, often the way museums do uh, in terms of that. Do you wanna just speak a little bit about the collection? Because I think the collection is tells the story of the museum uh, and the story that the museum tells. There was a great debate about whether the museum should even try to get collections because most people, nobody knew where they were um, and were they out there. But I realized that at the Smithsonian, people come to see the Wright Flyer, the Ruby Slippers, the Greensboro Lunch Counter. So if you don't have the stuff of history, you're gonna fail. And I remember thinking, okay, well, how do we find this? And then one day I actually watched something that I'd never seen called Antique Roadshow. 
And I thought, what a really good idea. So we rebranded it as Saving African-American Treasures and went around the country and said, bring out your stuff. But not that we would collect it, but that we would help you preserve grandma's old shawl, that 19th century photograph. And then people got excited and began to give us things. And we received things that I never thought we received. We received a hymnal that Harriet Tubman, the great abolitionist, carried with her throughout her life, which included all those songs she would sing when she'd go into the South to encourage the enslaved to run away. We received a guitar that Chuck Berry wrote those early songs on, like Maybelline. Of course, he, de he demanded that I also take his candy apple red Cadillac. Um, so I didn't really want it, but my staff was smarter than me. And now that candy apple ca red Cadillac is one of the most photographed objects in the museum. So the key was to go around the country to ask people to share not their stuff, but their lives, their family's history and that we were able to find over 40,000 objects of which 75% came out of the basements, trunks, and attics of people's homes. So it's as if people were waiting for the Smithsonian to say, we care about the stories that you care about. Here is an opportunity for you to help shape, shape this museum. And to me, one of the greatest days around opening was when I had a reception for all the people who gave material to the Smithsonian, and to see grandparents sharing their excitement with grandchildren, to watch old friends come together and talk about their involvement in the civil rights movement. It was really one of the most important days of my career. And so I feel unbelievably lucky that I got to work with gifted people um, who really could sort of make my dreams real and create a museum that I think um, is really important at any time but especially a time when we're grappling with the challenge of race in our lives today. Lonnie, you are, uh, you know, at, at AU, we use the change makers for a changing world and you are that, and you uniquely um, know how to tie scholarship and research of the academy, you're a historian, um, with the real world impact for change. And can you talk a little bit about how to, to complete and, and bring those things together, the, the, the things of the academy and that research and scholarship together with the present and informing the future? And I'd like for you to do it in the context of a museum by maybe focusing on one exhibit, an exhibit that you come back to that helps you and helps us all think about that relationship of uh, scholarship, research, facts, and understanding history, and using museums and exhibits to do that and inform our present and future? I think that um, for me, scholarship is the engine of the Smithsonian. Um, it's really the sort of lifeblood of what we do. But I realized something um, by working in museums. Academics talk a lot about the impact of history, how important it is but I'm not convinced we share that enough with the public. So part of my goal was to build a museum that would be driven by scholarship, but that scholarship would be used to give the public useful tools to understand the lives they're living, to contextualize the challenges they face, and to really remind them that history is this amazing reservoir that you can dip into for sustenance. And for me, it really was one single exhibition. It was the exhibition where we told the story of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. Emmett Till's mother was somebody I knew in Chicago. And she used to talk to me about how important it was that she carried her words, the burden of Emmett Till's memory. And she asked, do I also, will I also help carry that memory? And so when we came, when I came back after she passed away, we had an opportunity to, the family called me and said the original casket was available. Um, would you take it? And at first I thought, no, I, that's kind of ghoulish. And then I kept hearing her words where she said, at the worst moment of her life, Mamie Till Mobley said, I wanted to keep the casket open so the world would see what they did to her 14 year old son. And that moment transformed the civil rights movement, it rejuvenated it. And so for me, Every day when I was director of the museum, at some point during the day, I would walk down 
and I would sit by that casket so that I could hear Mamie Mobley's voice telling me that this story is not just about yesterday, but it's a story that should make us motivated to help America live up to its stated ideals. It should really help us create new generations of activists who are willing to sort of say, here's what we expect from this country. And it was a way for me to pay homage to the fact that women, African-American women, have been so central to the stories, to the history, and often their stories are left out. So all of that sh is shaped by that exhibit on Emmett Till. And as you think about that exhibit, Lonnie, and you think about the visual that we saw earlier, that technology now provides the, the visual, the visual of the casket and the open casket and why she did that. And we saw a visual early in the summer uh, on video in, in terms of a visual that was very powerful. How do you think about the role of technology now um, as part of and incorporating in um, what museums do and think about? Well, I've always thought that museums have a social justice role, that the job of a good museum is in some ways to define reality and give hope. And part of what I felt very strongly about was that museums needed to figure out how do you communicate that to different audiences, to younger audiences, to new audiences. And candidly, the pandemic taught us that more Americans, more people globally, are interested and able to receive content digitally than ever before. So for me, the question was, how do I find the right tension between tradition and innovation? How do I build on the wonders of, in the bricks and mortar museums of the Smithsonian? How do I build on the amazing research and science? And I realized that part of that was pivot to a digital first strategy but to also recognize that that strategy has to mean that a museum is more comfortable sharing authority, not simply pushing out information, but recognizing that there are gonna be debates, there's gonna be opportunities to learn more, to understand your audience better. So I think that's crucially important to the future of places like the Smithsonian. I think that the challenge is to make sure that we find the right tension that we don't run away from some of our strengths, but we recognize that rather than think about, is this an actual or a virtual experience to sort of integrate this and to say, how does this experience reap the benefits of both so that more people are engaged, more people learn and more people are made better by the experience. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to remind folks that, that if they want to um, ask some questions, we're going to turn to that. I'll ask one more and then we will turn um, uh, to others' questions. And that question is, tell us about what you loved about your alma mater when you were here and what you love about it now. What I loved was the generosity of the faculty. I remember walking into Clark Hall um, and asking to talk to a professor. And it turned out it was a woman named Dorothy Gondos. And she sat down with me and we talked for an hour and a half about history, about what does it take to be a historian? And I remember thinking every five minutes, I kept looking at my watch going, I, I gotta get up because I'm t wasting this woman's time. And she talked to me powerfully about the importance of history, the importance of scholarship. And that continued throughout my time at AU. The faculty, whether it was Alan Crowd, Alan Lickman, Valerie French, people were always generous in giving of their scholarship of a, and of themselves. So I think to me, that notion of feeling that AU was home um, was really important. And now I think what I'm very taken by is the fact that AU has never forgotten that it's part of Washington, DC that while it does so much amazing work globally, that it's important to use the resources of this city to be able to engage students, to challenge students. And I love the notion of being in a global city that AU had such a strong international vision and international presence. So for me, what I think is powerful is that AU gives people today an opportunity to find themselves, but an opportunity to find themselves in ways they would have never imagined before they got here. 
And I think the generosity of faculty um, is just as strong as it was when I was a 20 year old kid trying to figure out, okay, how do I figure out how to write that paper that I didn't do work on until tonight? Um, so I think that AU has really been a place that really for me is a place of possibility. That to me, creating possibilities for students, creating possibilities for faculty to cross disciplinary lines. That's one of the great strengths of AU. Thank you, Lonnie. And Courtney, I'm gonna welcome you back so that we can take some other folks' questions. All right, wow. You know what, you're both so inspiring and so uplifting and that feels really good right now. I'm just trying I'm to keep up with Sylvia, that's all. <laughs> Doing it, it's fantastic. I would like to kick off uh, with a question from AU parent, Michael Faraci. And Michael asks, I'm sure James Smithson had no idea how his gift would touch millions of lives for centuries to come. Thinking of the future, what's ahead for the Smithsonian for the next five, 10 and 50 years? New museums? more virtual tours of existing treasures? Yeah. I mean, I think that in some ways, the Smithson story tells us the power of philanthropy, right? I mean, we don't know when we give often where the philanthropy is gonna go in the long term, but I think it's so powerful that even though he couldn't have imagined this, he is, his gift transformed America. And so as I look at the Smithsonian now, part of it is thinking about what is our digital first strategy? How do we make sure that we're embracing the best of technology? I also think that um, there is always going to be need for additional museums. Um, I think that you will see probably in the next 20 years, um, maybe a museum of Latino-ish culture. Um, and I think that what for me is important is that whether or not there are new museums, that the Smithsonian will continue to expand its, its ability to be inclusive, to make sure that it reflects the America and models the behavior that we want from America. I also think that what you will see is you will see the Smithsonian in every classroom and in every home. Um, I want the Smithsonian to be that ubiquitous so that people can draw from the wonders of the Smithsonian anytime they need. So there'll be more virtual tours. There'll be more virtual scholarship. There'll also be more collaboration with universities, um, but also with sort of companies and businesses that we haven't figured out how to work with yet. Because one of the things that's clear over the next five, 10 or 15 years, the Smithsonian will not have broad enough shoulders to do everything. But if it can find ways to collaborate, to work more effectively with AU and others, I think that it'll extend our reach and it'll make us better. We stand ready. Okay. <laughs> we'll be partners. So here's another question. We received several questions in the same vein about leadership in today's world. This is really for both of you. As leaders, what are your thoughts on effectively bringing people together during a time of disruption and division? And how have you seen leadership styles evolve as we navigate this time? Sylvia? You know, I think during this time, um, the old adage that God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason, um, I, I think applies, especially as we are trying to bring people together. And the point being listening. Um, listening as a concept of leadership, real listening, um, I think is something that is particularly important um, during this time where we have such division and it becomes so important to hear. And I think leaders modeling that behavior of listening um, is an important part. The second thing that I would say in, in terms of something that I think is particularly important now is to focus on substance and facts. And that as leaders, that the, um, the importance of really making sure that you have the absolute best accuracy that you can and encouraging people to be grounded in substance and facts and using your own um, you know, communication with your communities as leaders to have those substance and, and facts. I think during this particular time, those are two things that I would highlight as 
really quite important to help get us all to a, a different place um, where the struggles of conflict um, are not as large and that we can you know, row together uh, as a nation. I think that for me, it's building on the line I mentioned earlier, which real leadership is defining reality and giving hope. And that in essence, what I think has to happen is that leaders need to think about two things. One is to recognize that they've got to themselves embrace ambiguity and then help the public, help the people they work with to embrace that ambiguity. Because I think, as Sylvia said, part of what listening is, is recognizing that there aren't simple answers to complex questions. And that sort of to help the public embrace nuance and complexity and ambiguity, I think is a major contribution. Then I think the other is, good leaders at this time recognize it's about the greater good. And the greater good means that leaders have to figure out how, regardless of where they are, how they can help a nation when a nation's in crisis. To think very creatively about your role is both to do the business that you're hired to do, but how does that business help the country find healing, find insight, find contextualization, and in essence, find each other. That's what I think the new leaders, best leadership is gonna to have to do. Learn how to fight the good fight in a way to bring people together. And I think Lonnie's answer is, is very highlighted by COVID. And I have said all along the, in, in COVID-19, you know, two of the most important things that leaders, certainly executive leaders uh, can do is make sure that the nation from citizens to up through the, the federal government to hospitals have the tools. But the second thing is, is the communication. And Lonnie's point about ambiguity, I don't think, I think that people didn't understand the ambiguity of COVID-19, that pandemics evolve. And they evolve in terms of the trajectory of the pandemic. That's a natural for all pandemics. But even more than that, your knowledge changes. And so helping people deal with the ambiguity, know when you know something, know when you don't know something, and help people move through this changing information and the ambiguity of the pandemic um, in terms of, you know, I, our children ask uh, every day, when is this going to end? Uh, and, you know, it's not just our 11 and 13 year old who are asking that question. And so I think, you know, as you're suggesting, Lonnie, it is quite important. And we see how important that is in the middle of what we're in, in the middle of the ambiguity that we all are facing and all try and struggle with. But I think it's our leader's responsibility and all of us who have leadership roles um, to try and make sure that we recognize the ambiguity and create space and ways for people to work through it. My 92 year old mother asked me today, when's this gonna end? So it runs the full gamut. Next up, an alumna asks, the pandemic brought about a lot of change in the way we live, work and learn. So what positive outcomes do you think we'll see from this challenging time? Will there be greater access to education and history? What might that look like? I lost what you said. Can you hear me? In, all right, I didn't hear what you said. For some reason, my speaker just went dead. If you could say it again. We'll repeat it again. Please. So the pandemic has brought a lot of change, as we just talked about, in the way we live, work, and learn. What positive outcomes do you think we'll see from this challenging time? Will there be greater access to education and history? What might that look like? In some ways, there are several things that I'm seeing. One is... You know, there are 7,000 people that work at the Smithsonian, and we've always talked about one Smithsonian, and I've never seen it, but I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing people recognizing that this is a moment when you've got to cross disciplinary lines and museum lines. It's a, moment, it's a moment when everybody's scared, so everybody wants to bring their best to this. So I, I'm, I'm seeing a kind of um, sense of coming together. What I'm hopeful and what I'm a little disappointed is I don't, I don't see that through the country. What I would hope is that through this kind of pandemic where everybody's concerned, everybody's suffering, that you'd want to see people coming together to figure out how do we come, how do we make this work? I think the other thing that is clear to me as this pandemic is that it really means that we as leaders have to think about the fact that 
we are in such uncharted land um, and that as Sylvia said, we're going to have to be more nimble, be more flexible, whether it's changing the way we ask our staffs to work. Um, but I think the most important thing for us is to recognize that this is a moment where rather than figure out how do I get through this, we should be thinking about how do we reimagine ourselves? How do we reimagine our institutions? How do we make sure that we've asked questions that maybe we should have asked a decade ago um, so that we can really make sure that not only are we going to survive this, but that this ought to allow us to thrive as institutions on the other side? And I think um, that sort of brings together a couple streams uh, in terms of as a university, one of the things that we have done during this entire time is in terms of the key priorities that are in front of us is we are focused on not just getting through, but how we thrive at the other side. And when asked about what's gonna be positive about COVID, there are a number of things that, you know, from health and mental health and all kinds of perspectives that I think are gonna be challenging for a long time to come. But where I think the opportunity is, is in the acceleration of change and acceleration of hopefully positive change. And when you look at our strategy, change makers for a changing world, there were a couple elements in our strategy that are actually accelerated by COVID-19. The fact that the day that I announced that our students would need to go online was the day that the chief online officer started at American University because already at American University, we had 500 courses online. Our online MBA is in the top, either top 12 or top 20, depending on uh, which you look, like, look at. Last week, we had another one of our masters of science uh, that's in the top 20 in the nation. And so we were on a trajectory. We know that online learning and the idea of lifelong learning, whether you do it face-to-face -face or online, is a concept that's going to increase access and affordability um, across higher education. The idea of inclusive excellence, this was something that was already in our strategy. We have had an inclusive excellence strategy for two years. Do we need to take what we are seeing over the summer? And we are doing that and incorporating them. But I think there are changes in many places that are going to be accelerated. Um, in terms of how we get to the next place and whether that's in education or another field I've spent a lot of time in, in health. Uh, if you look at the role of telehealth and we now know, and also all the things that said, people said couldn't be done, the idea that you can actually get a test in your car, driving up to a parking lot and get a, an important test and get important health information. Um, so I think that there are things that will be accelerated and I hope that we can do what Lonnie suggested, which is be nimble and take advantage of these opportunities. Sylvia and Lonnie both, I am going into this evening just feeling so optimistic and I wanna thank you both for providing that leadership and that sense of, of optimism. Thank you so much for your insights. We didn't get to all the questions tonight uh, because that is a really fast hour. We are closing in on the end of the program. It has been a remarkable evening. President Burwell, Secretary Bunch, thank you for sharing your thoughts in this discussion. Thank you. And Secretary Bunch, I guarantee I'm speaking for everyone on this call when I say you're an inspiration. We are so proud to count you twice among our eagles. And thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight in an unprecedented year, you've all continued to advance this university and empower our change-making work. Your generosity, enthusiasm, and dedication are critical. And they'll remain critical as we rise to meet complex, rapidly evolving, but surmountable challenges. We're grateful for your confidence in AU's future and for your partnership in carrying us forward. We could not do this without you. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>